I'm Francesca Borgo from the Department of History of Art and Architecture, and today I'm interviewing Professor Ronnie Pochasha from Penn State University, who just published this book titled A Jesuit in the Forbidden City, Matteo Ricci, 1552-1610. to Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for inviting me for this interview. So you come to this topic as a scholar of uh, religious and cultural history of early modern Europe. But with this book, you open up your work to a more global perspective. How would you define this intellectual trajectory? And does it reflect the conscious cultural agenda on your part? Well, I think all books are in some ways biographies. So my interest in this particular topic really originated from the time when I was growing up in Hong Kong and went to a Catholic mission school. And as you know, Hong Kong was right next to Macau, where Matteo Ricci first entered China in the late 16th century. So to me, there was always an allure, an exotic, interesting topic, which I knew one day I would want to study. Mm -hmm. But at that point, of course, I didn't know all of those languages. I somehow had the vague idea that I had to study before I could come to this. So it is both um, a personal story and, of course, an intellectual trajectory as well, because this is all we, we are interested in today in the global world. So. In the epilogue to your book, you mentioned that even the former and controversial Italian Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti wrote a biography of Ricci. How would you explain the continuous interest in this figure and even the weight of his myth? I can't explain why Andreotti, <laughs> il divo, is interested in Matteo Ricci. Certainly he is himself a Jesuit of sorts mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of his cleverness. But I think Ricci has become a symbol or symbols of different things to different people. And certainly the attractiveness for uh, China and for the Chinese is that he represented an era in which the West and China um, interacted on an equal basis. And that is before the 19th century invasion of imperialism, colonialism, and the confrontation between West and East. So that is a very, um, I think, obvious reason why the Chinese were interested in him. Celebrating him more as really as a, as a bearer of Western science rather than as Christianity as such. Now, I think his attractiveness to the West is more complicated. I think there have been various sort of figures in the encounter between East and West, and they signify different things. And Genghis Khan, for example, is also a figure in global interaction, but of course that represents, if you will, a conqueror of sorts, a builder of multinational empires with a different fascination for readers on the, in the West. Ricci, particularly in this appeal for Italians, was an Italian hero, but not only an Italian hero, but a Catholic hero. So in this sense, more than just a national figure and someone who can cross cultural boundaries, which we all aspire to do today. So I think that is the enduring interest of Ricci. So in your book, you describe how posthumous glorification of Ricci partially obscured the picture. Could you give us some concrete examples on how the use of Chinese primary sources help you in shaping a fresh understanding of Ricci's enterprise? Now, Ricci, when he represented himself in the Catholic enterprise in China, emphasized uh, the intellectual dialogue with Chinese elites, that is, um, conversation with the Confucian literati. But from the Chinese sources, we know, actually, if one were to read Ricci carefully, that in the first 12 years, the main appeal was that all of the Chinese, perhaps all of them, but certainly the overwhelming majority of them, thought of the Jesuits as representing and bringing in a new Buddhist teaching and doctrine. They were dressed like Buddhist monks with shaved heads. We also know from the Chinese sources that a number of the Chinese elites who had helped Ricci were attracted by the reputation of exorcism. Now, exorcism was, of course, something that uh, the Jesuits and other Catholic clergy practiced in the Counter-Reformation. But this was a very specific form of exorcism, uh, 
which was associated with the work of Ricci's senior associate, Michele Ruggeri, who has more or less been marginalized in this posthumous glorification. We know from Ruggeri's own records, which can be corroborated by Chinese records, that he engaged in what we would call today psychological counseling for young Chinese students who were in a terrible mental depression because of failure in examination, the famous Chinese examination hell. Uh, and that represented a moment of breakthrough because of the Jesuit's reputation at being able to help with people with severe psychological problems. The Ricci himself, in um, his early years in Guangdong, also engaged in one exorcism uh, with people who thought they were possessed by the demons, by the devil, by ghosts. Now, this is something that I think subsequent generations of uh, Jesuit missionaries also practiced because the majority of the convents were from the common people. But certainly, even for the Chinese educated classes, uh, the Jesuits were considered to be religious specialists, ritual specialists, particular, with particular uh, prowess and knowledge in exercising spirits, curing people with... Uh, with mental depression and all of this. So if we look at it from the Chinese perspective, it would offer, I think, a, a complementary picture of the one presented by Richie himself, which is primarily one of uh, intellectual and rational discourse between West and East. So as you as you write, as you said, and as you've wrote in the book, uh, it looks like Richie fashioned himself as a learned and wise scholar. Mm -hmm. And you also talk about his obsession with the rank and status of his network and mm -hmm. on his convert. A picture that is somehow difficult to reconcile with the apostolic mission of the Jesuit order and also its emphasis on preaching. And I would like to ask you, how would you, if you, if you think that his attitude was the only possible strategy for conversion mm -hmm. in that specific context, or the result of a uh, witchy personal attitude? I think we today have the ideal of the missionary as somebody who, uh, two things, who would cross um, cultural boundaries. I think it's a sine qua non. And that is certainly true of war missionaries from Catholic Europe and later from Protestant lands who went to um, the non-Western world to preach Christianity. But the second thing in our, I think, contemporary imagination is perhaps not quite true, and that is a uh, certain sense of, if you will, uh, sacrifice, social sacrifice, that he, you missionize among the poor. Mm -hmm. Well, Mother Teresa, for example, is, is a very good idea. I think from the very beginning, there were uh, divergent views among uh, Catholic missionaries of our period from the 16th, 17th centuries. There were missionaries who went out to, uh, in a way, unspoken agenda is to seek uh, martyrdom, especially those who went to Muslim lands. There were those who, uh, like Ricci, and in that sense, perhaps he was not representative of the major trend, but specifically to China, that is, of establishing a cultural dialogue and intellectual dialogue at the highest level. Now, that, again, had its historical precedence in the conversion of the world of antiquity, that is, the Christian dialogue with Greek philosophy in the Roman Empire. And Ricci, I think, very much saw himself in that light. He was primarily a humanist by training. He only finished his theological training in India. And he was not a great theologian. I mean, his, his great strength was his linguistic abilities, his cultural sensibilities. After Ricci, in fact, the person who succeeded Ricci as the superior of the China mission was another Italian um, uh, Longobardo from Sicily, and he adopted a very different approach, which was much more true, let's say, of uh, rural pe preaching among the uh, common people, uh, miracle works, um, if you will, spiritual healing, and that was a, a quite a different approach. And within the Jesuit missionary order in China, there had always been these two tendencies. And they work very well together, but they were all obviously also periods of tension. Thank you very much for answering my questions. You're welcome, Francesca. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.